Well, thank you, Andrew. I, I, my first interest in mass casualty triage, I was nine years old and my mom was friends with those on the rescue squad. So I was a moulage victim in a simulated plane crash that hit the Knoll Country Club uh, clubhouse in Lake Hiawatha, New Jersey. And then, and then so it began. I took my American Red Cross advanced first aid when I was 16, started riding an ambulance with Rockaway Neck Youth First Aid Squad, uh, did an emergency medicine. U United States Air Force sponsored residency was at Malcolm Grow and had the fortune to teach military and emergency medicine where I really got into mass casualty incident triage. So here we go. This picture comes from Manchester, the Ariana Grande concert. And I just want you to think about this for a little bit. This is the mass casualty scene. It's one scene. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. So the objective today, the theory, the model form, uniform, model uniform core criteria or MUC, and the review of most mass casualty triage systems. This is the article that Andrew talked about. This came from the TIDE grant, a CDC TIDE grant terrorism injuries information dissemination and exchange another part of this grant was the blast injury which is a really neat program you can pick that up on the american college emergency physician website if you want to learn and teach blast injuries and all these people represent specific organizations i was the asap rep there's a rep from the american college of surgery committee of trauma and it goes down to the indian territory representative so this is a 2008 there's been 218 citations just from this article. So we looked at start and we, we classified it by system, the code, what color, and then specific status for the specific colors. And if there was any therapies or treatment interventions before assigning to the dead category and then specific comments. So this is start, which most people are familiar with. There's one attempt to open the airway through positioning. If not, then the patient's considered dead. The thing about START that we found interesting that we later thought was not appropriate in a mass casualty is counting. There's a lot going on and to sit and count with all that information that's coming, sensory overload, it will be very difficult to do. Jump START was developed for children one to eight years old. It's parallel START and triage. And it also involves some counting. Homebush comes from Australia, began in 1999. Good thing here is if you look at the uh, radio frequency, you can talk about radio. Uh, codes A for alpha, urgent, B is bravo. They do have a dying category. Again, one attempt to open the airway based on start and save, which is secondary assessment victim, well, I used to know that, um, we'll get to it, and then triage sieve, which deals with counting, a lot of counting, and then pediatric triage tape, which is great if everybody has one tape, but you probably need to carry a lot of tapes because they're going to get injured, the tapes are going to get ruined uh, depending on the, the environment. Care flight is, has an unsalvageable category. There's no counting. And the SACO triage method is proprietary, so you have to pay for it. It was based on a retrospective review of the Pennsylvania Trauma Registry, and you need a computer. So it's somewhat impractical in a mass casualty triage. Military triage, and since then NATO has a triage, and there's no counting here. And the, the big thing I think for a mass casualty triage is delayed is those that can wait six to eight hours before treatment. So in a catastrophic event, this is a good, a good system to use. Cesara, it was Italian. Camina is walk. E is for our conscious uh, hemorrhage, state of shock, insufficient represent respirations if there's a fracture and other pathology. The big thing in Cesara, there's no dead category and there's no dead because in the Italian system, only physicians can pronounce patients. So this is your basic start. And I chose this. And there's a lot of different algorithms on the web that you can pick, but specifically here, triage is sorting, no treatment. And only two interventions can be made during triage. 
open and clear the airway, apply direct pressure to major bleeding arteries, and patients will be reassessed at treatment areas. So it's like a one-time thing. You do the start and then you're done, which might work if you're in a geographic segment in a big field or there's a scene and, and you're the first responder, you're given your methane report, you're given a situation rep to the dispatch and then more people come and then you're released to triage and, and you geographically assign areas and you can go through and do this. So in 2011, there's been 51 citations of this article and this is where the salt came from. And it's pretty much the same people that carried over from the other. And I want you to pay attention here. It's a kind of a busy slide, but when you do look at the article, I just want you to help you understand a little bit more about this. But uh, this is a single, a single location as well. Triage distance must be applicable across the broad range of mass casualty incidents where there's a single location with multiple patients. So if it's difficult if you have an earthquake, if you have a tornado, if you're in Paris and there's four separate tr terrorist sites, and that's because you don't know what your red is compared to their red or what your yellow is compared to their yellow. So you can use salt for your scene, but you have to have a good understanding of the communication within the incident command to the transportation officer who's collecting all the information from all the different sites to understand who's going to be transported and when. It must be applicable in austere environments, cold, hot, warm, dry, in an area where you're in a wilderness or frontier in the United States or in a country where there's resources are constrained, triage systems are resource dependent. It has to be dynamic. So as opposed to start where it's a one time, SALT really looks at the dynamic triage decisions where you can roll through over and over. There are assigned triage categories visibly identifiable triage tags, tarps, or markers, and we have a, a neat little discussion about that later. And triage is dynamic. It reflects the patient condition at the time. Resources are going to change. You're going to know different patients, their, their conditions as well. So simple commands that's used to initially prioritize victims for individual assessment. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you, can you walk? Yes. Okay. Go there. It's dry, upwind, upgrade. Go there and stay there. People will help you. The problem is that in a mass casualty incident, there's self-referral and people just leave the scene and go to the nearest facility. And we'll talk some about that. So these are basically instructions for the scene where people can either leave and to an area, but don't leave the scene. So you can get them to move to an area. And then you'll look through those that can wave. And then you look for those that are laying on the ground that don't move. And those are the ones that you go to first for life-saving interventions. They're unable to follow commands. They're not making purposeful movements. Or if there's an obvious life threat, like a big pool of blood and external hemorrhage. The second priority are those that can wave, but they can't move. And last are for those that can move and get somewhere to be safe. And they're individually assessed once they get there. So those some might, might be able to walk if there's a blast. And then you come upon them and they're kind of in the green area, uh, but they have blood from the ears after a blast. They're really not green. They would be yellow because they have significant injury. So going back to the Manchester picture, people left and now you're le those that are on the ground. And there's someone here on the right. This guy's got his head up. He's talking to this fella as opposed to this one that's just laying there. You can see you have bystanders that are helping out. You have some initial treatment. I guess these fellows in, in green or yellow have some training. But you'll, the other thing about this, it's a blast, right? The lights are on. The sprinklers are not going. It's dry. There's some concern. I would think that maybe there's a second blast. So the people that are here have given up on thinking that. So always remember scene safety with a terrorist. There's blast one. There could be blast two. If you remember the abortion clinic bombing in Atlanta in the 90s. So life-saving interventions are considered for each patient, and then they're assigned a triage category. So first, you do your life-saving intervention, and then are they yellow, are they red, are they expectant, are they black? Now, we looked at life-saving interventions. The equipment has to be readily available. 
the interventions within the provider scope of practice. You can teach SALT to firefighters and law enforcement and rescue and public safety, but they are not going to be able to perform certain interventions like tension pneumothorax decompression. They should be able to provide stop the bleeding, which was a good thing that, that evolved since we did this in two, 2011 to stop the bleeding. They should maybe be able to do two rescue breaths for a child and auto injector antidotes if they're specifically trained, if there's intelligence ahead of time, let's say for uh, the Super Bowl or a political convention or some type of demonstration where you preposition your teams. Then each victim is assigned immediate delayed minimal expectant dead with some type of color, red, yellow, green, gray, black. The key that the CDC really wanted here is that everybody knows what the colors mean. If anything, you understand what the colors mean for your region, your location. And we felt that counting or timing vital signs was not necessary. Really, we looked at it then, and this is 2011. The only thing that counted that had any impact on outcome was the Glasgow Coma Score. All other counting really didn't mean much for outcome in the end. And diagnostic equipment must not be used for initial assessment. Blood pressure cuffs, stethoscopes are essentially useless in a mass casualty incident, particularly at the scene. Capillary refill is not a sole indicator of peripheral perfusion. We know that in the cold. Andrew, it's a bit cold where you are in Wisconsin. So capillary refill is not, not applicable. Also, um, if people are moist, if, they have, if they're sweating, depending on the uh, environment, it's difficult. Patients who are not breathing after one attempt, children two attempt, must be classified as dead and visually identified as such. So how would you visually identify this patient? Uh, if you have a blanket, you can put something over their head, you can flip their shirt up, you can use a coat. And the reason would be is that the next team that comes in that's doing a triage, they know that that person, they don't have to, to do much for that person other than account for them and keep them with some respect and dignity. So categories of media, if they're unable to follow commands or have a do not have a poor false or respiratory distress or life-threatening external hemorrhage, provided these injuries are likely to be survivable given available resources. And resources can come. And we looked at indirect science for this. And these are the different articles that we picked up. Now, in 2011, the systematic literature view was still in its infancy, as now you'll see systematic literature view as the science to determine treatment. We'll talk about that later as well. Patients are expectant, do not have peripheral pulse or obvious respiratory distress or life-threatening external hemorrhage and are unlikely to survive given current available resources. An older person with 70% burn, that would fit in here. Delayed if they make purposeful movements and, so the difference before was or, now it's and, have peripheral pulses and are not in rest or distress and do not have life-threatening external hemorrhage and have injuries that are not considered minor. Minimal are those basically that are walking, talking and have minimal injuries. <clears throat> this, if you look at the SALT algorithms that you can pick up online, the different graphs, they leave this off. So SALT, the T in SALT, deals with transport. Because yes, why are you putting people and patients into categories, red, yellow, green? It's who goes, who leaves the scene first? Who's transported first? So the efficient use of transport assets may include mixing categories of patients and using alternate forms of transport. As we saw in Las Vegas, there wasn't really much scene transport, but they certainly used alternate forms of transport. So I like this algorithm to look at, and it's adapted for a very large radiation emergency. And the reason is, it's down here. Step three, there's step one, global sorting. Step two, assess, individual assessment with life-saving intervention. So sort, assess, life-saving intervention, then transport, triage to transport. So the goal here, is who leaves the scene first that's not self-referred? Who gets in the what ambulance? Where do they go? And that should be coordinated with the incident command transport 
sector. Our objectives, science, exercise design and evaluation, and outcome study. So when you look at an article, look at the exercise design, and is it legitimate for a mass casualty incident? Is it a retrospective review of trauma that came to a hospital and you apply salt and you apply start? And we'll talk about an article later that did that. And outcome studies, what are the outcomes? What are you looking for? Was it accurate? Was the, the triage at the scene accurate? Does that really matter? What matters is the patient left that needed to go first that needed to go next, that needed to go next to get to definitive care. Resuscitate, stabilize disposition. It's what we do every day in the emergency department. It's really no different from the scene. Which patient needs resuscitation? Which person is injured such that needs damage control surgery? Practical, the MCI planning process. It's not the plan. The plan's the end of the journey. Your MCI planning process should involve all constituents, all stakeholders within your hospital, registration, pharmacy, your logistics or warehouse or, or those that come and, and re restock you. And how can you do that quickly? I'm going to go back to registration. How do you register hundreds of people quickly if you have a bigger emergency department? Or how, how will you register so many people in bad weather that they can't wait outside and they have to come into your hospital. Where will you put them? How will you do that? So your exercise design and evaluation really shouldn't be the whole thing. You should look at your plan, your planning process. How can we do this better? You can look at after action reports and there's plenty out there as to what went wrong. It's typically communication as we know, but bottlenecks that occur, occurred in, in Las Vegas was the ability to get medicine out of the Pixis. For those that don't understand this, the emergency department, there's this uh, machine that you, you can either, you, you put a code in or your finger or a retinal scan and out pops the medicine that you need. But if people aren't registered and you have to get medicine for 15 people at the same time, that's a problem. So how can you override Pixis to do that? Special considerations, which we're not gonna talk about is, um, is chemical and IGSA, which is inhalation gas syndrome assessment, which came out of the Graniteville train crash in 2005. The University of South Carolina Nursing uh, Department put out a really nice uh, triage, mass casualty triage for this. It really hasn't been studied, but the, I think it's something to think about. And then nuclear radiation, and then there's the SAVE triage, which is secondary assessment victim endpoint. Sorry, I didn't get that earlier. So this is the first study we're going to look at. And this came out soon after the muck. Uh, we had the SALT done then, but really didn't publish it. Uh, we didn't push it that much. But the pilot test, the SALT mass casualty triage system, there's 50 victims and two non-victims. They looked at paramedics um, that were, that were uh, seasoned. They had been involved in prior mass casualty incidents. They were SALT trained. They did get SALT training one week before a 90 minute class using flashcards, 41 of the 52 SALT verified patients. So 13.5% were over triage, 3.8% were under triage. Now they looked at their baseline or their marker was just regular triage to a level one trauma center. 50% is an accepted over triage rate and less than 5% is your under triage rate. As we know, over triage, could overwhelm your trauma center, use critical resources, which could be a problem in a mass casualty incident, right? You don't want to have 50% too many people go to your level one trauma center when they need to get people processed through appropriately to get to the OR appropriately to use resources such as triage, uh, assets, registration, to put people where they need to go quickly. So over triage in a mass casualty incident could potentially be a problem, but then again, you're gonna be over triage because people are gonna self-refer. So when you look at this and you look at this study, um, it, it's, it's a good study. It, it it's came out with low under triage and needs refinement and they didn't look at patient outcome. So as the first study looking at SALT, um, I think it has some merit. The next one, it's a little difficult to, to get through. There were mannequins and victims. There were salt verified. 
it's two groups of students and some of the students don't really participate in a mass casualty incident clinical management there were pharmacists there are two groups two locations different populations of students there were uh eight to eleven and then and then in the first group and then the last group there were 235 victim observations so what happened was they looked at the first people in each group so that that evaluated patients that triage them and then they the next group there were eight or eleven depending on the group um had the opportunity to look at what the triage was before them and they can correct it right so the first people that was 81 percent correct eight percent under over triage 11 percent under triage but by the time you got the first group at eight the next group had 11 uh, students they were able to look at all the others before them and they came out to 83 percent correct eight percent sorry came to six percent over triage and 11 percent came to 10 percent but when they reported their data they looked at the cumulative data of each group so even though the initial triage was 81 percent the first person they just looked at what the last person did when they reported it their conclusion minimal experience right they say minimal experience well of the 63 percent had prior drill experience 29 percent of prior mci experience and 21 percent heard or saw so they do they have minimal experience in mci triage that's a debatable and they also said higher accuracy than than start but they didn't really apply start to those patients and they didn't have a comparison between salt triage of the patient scenario which was a bomb blast in the community concert they didn't compare it using salt or start they didn't compare that specific scenario they just looked at other start data and apply that to this scenario so that's difficult to compare apples to apples here this looked at comparison of salt and smart triage smart triage is a variation of salt that controls bleeding after you follow simple commands so it's kind of like um it's kind of like um start this time it was 22 paramedics so they had no prior experience they had at least one week prior to the scenario they had assault training with 45 minutes of didactic 45 minutes of practical and then a week later at least a week later they had 25 virtual patients then they did it again with a three-month washout so in theory they didn't remember the salt and then they had the same smart training so the salt 70 percent were correct in smart 90 percent in salt 6.8 percent were over 1.8 percent were over and here 23.2 percent were under and 5.1 percent were under so if you look at what's better you would say smart right because 1.8 percent over and 5.1 percent under the big part of this study to me is that it was virtual reality so in 2011 you're looking at computer simulation to actual study and they compared training between two groups heads up using two different triage methods so it's actually a good study in looking at two different triage methods in the same scenario this one comes from 2015 again heads up between simple triage alg algorithm and rapid treatment sort assess so salt in a mass casualty for sensitivity specificity predictive values what they looked at here was outcomes and this is how they define their outcome so the triage category was minor or green tag and their their outcome was a minor ed procedure splint sling observation or suture they went home delayed yellow tag if there was a big procedure which was surgery they got blood a chest tube or some type of angiographic procedure to stop the bleeding and occurred 12 hours after the patient got to the ed immediate this was done within the 12 hours dead expectant black as they die within 48 hours after arrival to the ED and they looked at cerebral performance category scale of four to five upon discharge. So someone went to a nursing home and they looked at start and start and salt heads up. Green outcomes now 66, 76 delayed yellow start was better. Immediate red salt was a little better. And it's interesting. They were both able to predict dead. Their conclusion, neither SALT nor START algorithm was appropriately sensitive for determining 
of victims level of triage, especially in critically injured who would require immediate intervention. So what we knew in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, that really neither one's better. But it's a start. Now, look at this study from 2016. This is a survey of emergency responders. And the key here is that there's really some EMTs that are in the field. Maybe there's an advanced practice nurse that's riding a truck. Maybe a physician or physician assistant that's riding a truck on the scene. Because remember, SALT, START, it's a scene first responder triage system. But they did a survey nonetheless. And these are the breakdown. So of the survey, 402 of the 495 were completed. 8% said they used Gestalt or a gut feeling. They didn't practice a structured triage. And still, I don't know how you actually can prove that, that they practice a structured triage, I guess in their mind or in their head, or that's what they've been taught. And that's what they learned the first time throughout. Like they only learned salt. They never learned start. I don't know how you would do that. But to me, this study, 8% gestalt. And who's sick, who's not sick, right? It really is binary, resuscitate or not. And if you resuscitate, you immediately get transported. If it's not resuscitate, then you can wait. And how long can you wait? And of those waiting, who needs to go next? So when you look at the literature, whatever the MCI is, is that the study population that fits for your hazard vulnerability analysis, for your facility, for your agency? So you look at the education of the participants in the study. What was the timing? It, did they get a class and then a day later? So are you then testing the actual method, salt, start, whatever? Or is it just that you were able to teach somebody something and remember it a day later? Right. So the content becomes important. So the timing is if you taught them in May and then you test them in December without further, further maintenance, further continuing education. So that becomes an important when you're looking at the literature, the scenario, does it replicate an MCI? And then look at the data points. What are you comparing as your baseline? What are you comparing to be? your your data that it should be good or bad uh you're you're making these great claims in the article that we're better than this and are you able to compare apples to apples and then is it a computer simulation is it blended is it live and this becomes important because there are some artificial natures of artificialities of all three computer simulated blended or live as opposed to a true actual mass casualty incident so you have to look at that. And then there's consensus, which you just have everybody get in a room. And typically there's a few egos there. There's more important organizations. And in the end, they kind of dominate the conversation. But if you look at the Delphi way, which is the way things should go and are going in treatment algorithms, looking at the Cochrane, or other Prisma ways at Delphi, it, it's adapted from RAND in the 50s. It was meant to forecast the impact of technology warfare, and it's anonymous. It's an anonymous group of experts where there's questionnaires. So what you would do is you'd have a systematic literature review. You would come off to kind of where things should go. You would construct questionnaires. You could then send these questionnaires to, to experts particularly those that wrote the articles that you use in your systematic literature review. And then there's a statistical analysis of the results of this questionnaire. Then you repeat that as you, as you, you hone down on a, a consensus then that's anonymous and statistically relevant. It reduces the range of responses to arrive at a consensus. So what about the model uniform core criteria for mass casualty incident triage? The Federal Interagency Committee on EMS in 2013 issued this report where state and local EMS were asked to improve their MCI triage capabilities and to base it on the model uniform core criteria. Didn't say start, didn't say salt. It just said whatever you use, get together so you have 
mutual aid from other counties, other regions, and everybody's on the same page. In 2017, NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, addendum to paramedic instructional guidelines, model uniform core criteria. While there exist multiple systems for mass casualty triage, there's one national guideline. It's not salt or start. It's that the model uniform core criteria for mass casualty incident triage can be used to measure the essential elements within various MCI triage systems. So there can be study to measure, to study effectiveness where the science will lead to better treatment. In your MCI exercise design, education of those involved, training, and then maintenance. So mass casualty incidents really are infrequent. People are on board, they join your organization, your hospital, your agency, you have mass casualty incident triage, and then you have to have maintenance of that. And their exact role within the MCI and how they fit in the incident command. Are they gonna be on a fire truck and they get to the scene? They might be still involved in mass casualty incident triage because it's overwhelming. Earthquake, there's fires, there's explosions. Triage, is that what you want to design your exercise, the actual sorting, the color, transportation? Are they going to the right destination? And then when you look at your exercise, is your endpoint, is your goal over or under triage, over or under color, or over and under transport destination? Did the patient go to the right facility? Again, there's self-referral, which kind of gets in the way of all this, but you have to plan for that. And then is it your outcome, clinical outcome? Is that what you're really looking for, which might be hard in an MCI, even if it's computer simulation, because you really don't know what the outcomes are going to be. You can have different computer models with different um, mannequins that could lead to specific outcomes. But that would be expensive if, if you follow the mannequin from the scene all the way through the OR to the ICU to the floor. But you could do that on computer simulation. And then comparisons, what are you comparing it to? People ask all the time about triage tax. And I, I do not condone or promote this specific triage tax. But look how busy that is. Really, do you have time to do that? When we have time. But the key to me is this barcode. If we could tap into barcodes and a patient could get this at the scene and have a barcode and that would go into a registry that every hospital in the region then could tap into and even urgent care is the next day when someone self-refers home and they were given this triage tag and they don't feel well and the urgent care the next day could look at this and say, yeah, you actually were in this wreck. You were in this mass casualty incident, so let's talk about your injuries and how you're doing the next day. But if you could get a system where you were able to have this barcode from the scene and it already was in a registration bank, so when they got to your hospital now, you then just read this barcode and up they popped. So you then had labels that you could print. They were already in the Pixis. You could get them x-rays, et cetera. And then your registration people or even you or clerks or somebody from the floor can come down your MCI plan to augment registration to then enter the data, the demographic data. That would be a pretty neat system. Where that goes, I don't know. This is from uh, Gone with the Wind. And this is the scene in Atlanta. So just look at all those patients. Look at all those people. And that could look like the outside of your hospital if it's a good day and there's a train crash or a bus, a bus crash and you're the only hospital in an area, or this is your casualty collection point before people can actually get transported from the scene. Another triage tag, and this one that has a number that you could possibly write down or you could um, enter that into a computer bank of some type and you could keep that with them. The problem here is that if people go from immediate to yellow and you've ripped off the yellow, how do you give them back the yellow? And, the, and so the triage tag then becomes a problem. This is uh, two days after the Boston Marathon bombing. There was an anhydrous ammonia uh, fertilizer explosion in a city called West Texas. 
that was pretty much far away from a lot of hospitals. So they used two different casualty collection points, and this is a football field, and this is a community center. So I think here, triage tags could be used because you could really drill down into what's wrong with the person, and you kind of know you have your a finite victims because their people couldn't sell for fur anywhere. So they came to the casualty collection sites, and you could then really get a good number of what was going on. So this group in Japan looked at Shannon's entropy, which we're not going to get into, to look at risk of increasing information confusion with triage tags. You think about it. You're at the same level as somebody on a gurney. And how can you tell what triage they are? Are they red, yellow, green? If they have a tag on their foot or their ankle, you have to literally walk up to them to see what it is. So they looked at this and they found that using a low visibility triage tag increases the degree of confusion. So when you're doing your triage and you're looking at colors, consider geographic triage, um, put a marker somewhere. This is where green goes. This is where, where red goes. This is where yellow goes. Or use hallways in Las Vegas and other, other um, mass casualty instances. They use different parts of the hospital where they send people uh, to make it easier. I'm asked often, what should a hospital use? Should they use salt? Should they use start? In my mind, why do something that you don't do every day when the data shows that what the hospital, then the first receiver, uses every day? And they're really good at it. So this was a study comparing simple triage and rapid treatment, and the emergency severity index, which is what most emergency departments in the states use. So they compared START with ESI. There were 80 victims initially. Of those, uh, 23 were black, and one had to be excluded, so they wound up with 56. There was a, the different arms. There's an initial triage officer using EMS transport and START, and then there was a, a, a seasoned EM nurse and a mock field hospital using five-level ESI. So in the field, there were 18 red, 14 yellow, 26 green, and the ESI, 11 critical to three minor. So of the 56, both start EMS and ESI. Were, so that was their baseline. So it's a pilot study, really, because there's only 56. Um, 47 of the 56, so 84%, were equivocal by start. Eight, so 14% were lower severity by start, and one was, was higher severity by start. So their conclusion was equivocal prioritization. Using start in the field and the emergency severity index nursing triage at the hospital, there was some under triage using start, but not statistically significant. So do you, just on this study, low numbers again, but do you need to teach start or salt or whatever at your hospital when you do emergency severity index really well. Another study, this one in 2015, compared START to emergency department triage levels to determine the need for urgent care and predict hospitalization. 233 participants, START, the ESI, abnormal vitals, ESI got 88% right, START, got 51% right. Interventions, the more severe in the ESI, 95% right, and START only 33%. Admitted, ESI 98% right, 48% for START. Their conclusion, the ESI is better identifying patients with normal vital signs and those who need emergent interventions and those admitted than START. Last, this comes out of Canada, Canadian triage acuity stale. This is a really good study. Not a lot of patients, but their design is fantastic. They had a single ED triage control group, so the triage officer that used START, and their markers were what you do every day in your emergency department, bed assignment, physician assessment, and, and your disposition decision. So door to bed, door to dock, door to disposition. The control arm, the intervention arm, sorry, the intervention arm, 
you had a pre-triage officer using START, which is basically your EMS and your mass casualty incident triage. And then your triage nurses did another triage using the Canadian triage acuity scale. What they found was the pilot study, because of the low numbers, simulating disaster in the ED, and this was an airport crash, an airplane crash, simulating disaster in the ED in the middle of the ED. So just like a true mass casualty incident, your ED is flowing. It's a busy day in your emergency department. And on top of that, you have the mass casualty incident. So the scenario, the setting for this study was elegant and well done. And they looked at your typical markers, your door to dock, your door to bed, your door to disposition. And it was found that there was no statistical difference in patient flow and triage accuracy when comparing the two-step triage method start, then your Canadian triage acuity scale, and just start alone. So in the end, if you're a hospital or a healthcare facility, I would just say, keep doing what you're doing and work on registration if you want to make things well and work on how you're going to handle the self-referred patients first. So your mass casualty triage to me isn't whether you want to do start, salt, just keep doing what you're doing every day, but work on that front door when you're going to get these massive people and how you're going to handle them. So final thoughts. Your mass casualty instant triage is really about resource consumption. Who gets resuscitated? Who needs to be stabilized? And then disposition. Look at it as a first responder when you're looking at studies and then a first receiver. And when you're looking at first receiver studies, is it the self-referred that just show up or is it those that come by EMS that have already been somewhat uh, triaged using whatever you're using in your, in your location, salt or start? In my mind, you keep it what you do every day. And that goes with first responders as well and first receivers in the hospital. Life-saving intervention, teach that. You can have firefighters do some of this. You can have law enforcement, public safety. Um, if you have a building and you have security at your building, why not teach them SALT? They can do an AED. You teach them AEDs. That works well. You can teach them some life-saving intervention, maybe not needle decompression. Maybe you can teach them auto-injector if you're in an area where terrorism is a, possible, a problem. People are taught auto-injectors for epinephrine. They can be taught for auto-injectors if there is a chemical and they get on the radio, please use your auto-injectors. It's dynamic. It changes. It changes. It changes. Not only is the possibility that there are more people, but the situation might change. Earthquake, tornado, and then transportation decisions, which is the ultimate in your mass casualty incident triage, the SALT, the T, transportation decision, who goes there. In the end, whatever your plan is, it's not the plan, it's planning and maintenance of your plan. Work with all stakeholders within your hospital, those that are going to use your hospital. If you have uh, a university, if you have an event, um, some type of concert. You can work with them and so everybody gets there and says, God forbid something happens, this is the hospital we want you to go to. This is where you will go if there is an event. And that could be a storm, it could be a sudden thunderstorm, it could be a, a sudden gust of wind where the stage props get blown up. You could be in a nightclub where there's a stampede, where there's a fire. You can, you can message that from the scene. You can work with your local emergency planning committee and get the word out to all venues how to use the mass casualty incident plan in your community. And be, be critical when you're looking at the literature. I'll leave you with this. Uh, comes from the European Master of Disaster Medicine. The management of health impact of disaster is one of the most difficult tasks to be performed by health workers. It is up to all of us on this call to inquire, to be critical of the literature, and participate in scientific examination. If you have an idea, there's different academic centers, Harvard Humanitarian Institute, um, UT Southwest, UMass, Amherst, um, Medical University of South Carolina, there are disaster centers in the states. 
There's international centers like the EMVM, which is part of Crimidum, um, Karolinska. You can also look at the World Association of Disaster and Emergency Medicine, the Society of Disaster Medicine and Public Health, ASEP, USEM. If you have an idea to study, reach out. A little word about Brisbane. It's now accredited, so if you can go, uh, you will get CME. These are the keynote speakers, Greg Seatone, Mark Keim, Joanne Liu from MSF, and uh, Robert Muga. Uh, if you want to get more SALT training, this is a free online through the National Disaster Life Support Foundation, and you can get this free. So if you really want to teach this uh, within your agency, your hospital, if you're security guards at a plant of some type or a big building, and you want to treat, teach some type of, of triage method, you can do that. Last, a quote, um, an enjoyable learning experience from Benjamin Franklin. Teach me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. So the more involvement that everybody in your agency is with their mass casualty incident plan, they bring literature, they bring studies, they get involved, and they'll make it better. So any questions? This is my email address. I'd be happy to answer any questions here. If you think of something later, uh, send me an email. I'd be happy to help you out. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interest. Um, thank you for trying to help those in your community and those at your hospital and those at your agency. Um, my hat's off to you. Thank you, Eric. Um, we are now at the point of the webinar where we can take questions from the remote audience. Um, so, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, if you use the, uh, the hand icon, which essentially is, uh, I guess, the equivalent of raising your hand, uh, we can unmute your microphone and you can ask a question directly, uh, or you can send a question um, <clears throat> through the question uh, panel as well. Um, but if you can ask a question orally, that's uh, preferable, so then we can get a discussion going. Uh, so at this point, um, if anyone in the audience has a question, please uh, go ahead and we can uh, unmute your microphone and you can ask a question directly. So we apparently have a shy group here. I don't see anyone raising their hand just yet. Um, uh, I did get a question um, during the presentation and I think I answered it but um, might as well ask you directly. Um, someone asked about um, a list of the publications that are referenced in the slides if we'd be able to share something like that. Um, I know most of them seem to be um, pretty well documented in each respective slide but is there a list that we could also share? Uh, pretty much what I, whatever article I, I spoke of I, I have uh, the reference. Uh, but if anybody has anything specifically, they can shoot me an email and I'll, I'll help them out to, to find the article that they need. Okay, we have one question here uh, from Hussein Mohammed Shagar, and I mispronounced your name, I, I apologize. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone and you can ask a question. Are you there, Hussein? Hello. He may have stepped aside. I unmuted his microphone, but he doesn't seem to be there. Uh, so we'll go ahead and mute. Um, does anyone else have a question? I have one. Uh, I have a shy bunch. Everyone's sending questions here. OK. Um, bear with me here a moment. Oh, we have a comment. Uh, no question, excellent presentation from Mario de Janeiro, um, and he's asking about uh, a recording, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we are recording this, and we'll post it online sometime tomorrow, uh, Friday, and uh, we'll send out an email to the registration list, letting everyone know that it's um, available online. Um, we have another question here from Leanne Olson. Uh, Leanne says, is there any data on mass casualty efforts in a low res in low resource countries or communities where transport is a major issue? 
That's an excellent question. And no, there's no data. It really hasn't been studied. In my EMDM class, um, one of my classmates was from Nigeria. And she raised her hand. I was like, I don't know how to do this because we really don't have a formal EMS. So how do you how do you do it then? And it's really hard. I think you have to involve any government or official volunteer, get into the the local religious orders wherever you are and, and try to get them to to understand who goes first. And it might be that there's there's just pickup trucks that take people to the to the clinic or to the hospital into the city. So no, no, there really is no data. Um, I would just look at who brings patients to your facility and talk to them. One of the students from last year's EMDM is in Ghana and he's looking at training taxi drivers to help with the transport of a mass casualty incident. And that's pretty innovative and creative. And I wish Joe all the best in his, in his pursuit. So, yeah, I, I think you have to look at on an everyday basis how do patients get to you and then roll it out from there. Very good question. Excellent question. Thank you. All right, we have another question here from Brenna Edelman. And Brenna asks or says, the U.S. has MUC, um, but no standard single triage system. Do you know if other countries also have one recommended triage methodology or system of recommendations similar to MUCC, M-U-C-C? So depending on what country you're in and what region you're in, I think that there are different, like the Australians have Homebush and Sieve. The uh, Europeans are, are looking more towards um, NATO, I think. Uh, but I think the, the purpose of MUCC is to get everybody on the same page. So it's really not um, one better than the other, but just everybody to get together and agree on one. Because some countries, it's all volunteer, uh, like volunteer fire, volunteer rescue. There's the Red Cross that are involved, the Red Crescent that are ambulances. There's religious orders, uh, misericordia in certain countries. So yes, I agree. Um, and it's a very good question. So no, I, I think just within the states, the the government has asked that everybody at least get on the same page. So the triage system is MUC adherent. And there are many other triage systems that are MUC adherent. But I think discussions need to ensue. So everybody's on the same page and use the same color, use the same criteria. Good question. OK, we have another question. Um... Everyone seems to be wanting to send them to me, and that's, that's quite all right. Uh, this is from Lily Borowski, uh, and she says, are there any rapid registration processes that you are aware of? Wow. If you could figure that out, you can retire. No. <laughs> um, and no, there isn't. Um, the old-fashioned way where you just had a box of, of already named armbands, let's say 2000. 2019 001, 2019 002. And with that, like paper made it a lot easier because everything could already be pre printed. You have labels pre printed, your charts were pre printed, your order forms were pre printed based on that. And then later, registration would go and, and look at the number. So now, no, it's a real drag. Um, some facilities depended on Epic or Cerner. Um, and they are looking at that. I'm working hard within my uh, health information management people to develop a system, and it's going to include charting too, which is a rolling chart. So to me, it, it's it's with the barcode. If I was going to do something, and I if I had a if I had the wherewithal, I would do barcodes because you could even have your your tab your tablet could read the barcode. So if they got a barcode at the scene, no matter where they went and everybody had the same tablet and you could look at the tablet so you know who that barcode was and you took a picture of the person or a tattoo of the person or some other identifier of the person, attach that to the barcode, and then at some point registration could catch up. But once you have that barcode and you accepted that barcode into your facility and that became the registration number, then you could use your orders. You can go to Pixis and get your meds. You can, your labs could be ordered. Your, your x-rays could be ordered. So no, not there yet. But I think after Las Vegas, 
um, some smart person sitting in Omaha or Silicon Valley hopefully is going to take up this charge and figure it out. But that is a great question. Wow. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. We have a few people now who um, have their hand raised. So we're going to try, uh, try this again. Uh, the first person I have here is Deanna Dalgrove. Um, Deanna, I'm going to go ahead and mute your microphone and um, you can ask a question here. Are you there, Deanna? Yes, I'm here. So, um, Dr. Weinstein, my question has to do with, um, I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician and clearly um, pediatrics is 25% of the population in some places of the world, much, much more. And a lot of these triage systems other than Jumpstart um, are challenging to use with kids, especially under the age of eight, especially when they're scared with their mental health, not being able to respond, get up and walk, follow directions, things like that. In addition to other vulnerable populations um, like um, you know, the deaf, blind, um, people like that, that um, obviously can be involved in an MPI as well as people that have mobility challenges and mental health challenges and what the triage processes might look for those individuals because I think I, I struggle with those. That's a great That's a question. question. And, and there really, really haven't been studied. Um, what was done in, in Manchester, um, there was a, a children's hospital not too far from the scene and the adults and the kids went there. So the sicker kids went there because it's not only the, the color code and who goes, but where do they go? If you have a, a pediatric hospital, if you're, you're lucky in your region, do just the kids go there? And, and how do you do triage on an everyday basis? So to me, I wouldn't change the triage system that's used every day for kids and, and how the trauma system has evolved in your region who goes to your trauma, your pediatric trauma center, your pediatric ER, and how you triage pediatrics every day. It's too complicated, I think, to introduce anything else. The Braslow tape and, and an other tape system might be something that, that could be done, but it really hasn't been studied. Excellent question. I think it's more of a destination thing than than actual color coding. And I think if you do your everyday destination, I think you'll be best served. Good question. All right. We have a couple more folks who have their hands raised. Um, we have Sarah here. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, Sarah, so I'm going to not mispronounce it. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone, uh, and you can ask your question. You there, Sarah? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, just in regards to the other comment about or question about um, triaging and developing a, like an EMR or a patient tracking system, um, I'm actually presenting mine at um, Brisbane in May on May 7th um, during like the North American chapters um, section. I think it's at like 1130. Uh, we developed our EMR. Uh, we're volunteers. We don't do it for a living, but we developed it after volunteering in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti and noticed a need um, back then. It's been used worldwide in short-term medical missions, um, like primary care clinics mostly. And we're using the data to improve the quality of care in those mobile clinics in very austere settings. But someone used it in Peru and he's associated with the urban search and rescue crews out in California. So we tested it with the urban search and rescue crews in California last year uh, and testing went well. I'm not sure if it's the answer, but it's certainly um, worth seeing. And the system's called FEMER. Uh, fast electronic medical records. Um, so anyway, we're still in testing. I just want to put that out there, and uh, I look forward to meeting you all in, uh, in May. Thank you for doing research, and thank you for publishing it. It's so important, really important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jay McIsaac. Uh, Jay's just asking if the slides are available. Uh, they will be available. Um, uh, sometime tomorrow at the latest, along with the recording. So uh, we'll send that email out to the registration list and let everyone know about that um, when they are online. Um, and then uh, the gentleman we tried to have ask a question at the beginning has sent me a question. Um, and it looks like he would like to ask it orally. So Hussein, if you're there, I'm going to unmute your microphone. We can try this again. Are you there, Hussein? 
Okay, well, I do have his question here, so I'll just read it. Um, Uh, I'm afraid that I must have lost that question. Um, well, that was the last question that I have here, unless there's anyone else. Oh, here we go. Uh, we have one other question here. Uh, it says, is there a study where any triage is used on a population with language barriers or persons with disabilities? No. <laughs> the simple answer is no. Um, and, and again, I think that what you do every day is what I would would emphasize here, how you would you would triage that person and sort that person out as to who goes where it's maybe something that they don't self refer that they would stay and go to the and, and stay and go to the authorities that are at the mass casualty incident scene, those with uniforms. Um, if you can't get a good history. So then you really have to go to your physical exam. Are they upright and walking? Can they follow some commands with your arm? Can you can you, you point them in direction they go there? Uh, but if they're, for whatever reason, in a wheelchair or um, they have disabilities that they are, they're deaf or they're blind or um, they need some type of aid to walk with, it makes it difficult. So you have to then adapt to what you do every day and just apply it for that one patient. Your life-saving interventions really wouldn't change. You, you would still, if you believe there's a tension pneumothorax, you would stop the bleeding, you would give rescue breaths, et cetera. But then to assign um, red, yellow, depending on then um, a secondary assessment, I think would be important where you can then look at your vital signs, uh, your, your blood pressure, your heart rate, and the relationships there as you move on down. So uh, start again and again and again um, if, if that's the method that you use to decide where somebody is so in essence no not that i'm really aware of that's a good study uh something something that can be done because uh, you always get the the dialysis bus is the one that crashes and that's your scenario so good question i, I don't have a good answer for you other than my default answer which was back to the pediatric question is do what you do every day and and use that life-saving interventions and then how you would how you would triage that person and how you would sort that person to go first or second or third to the hospital so good question well okay this good, Andrew. yeah no it's really good um i did find hussein's question here um i try the best to paraphrase it because it's a it's a multi-part question and it's a little unclear but uh, he's asking a question about uh, the point in the presentation where you mentioned training staff um, to help change the situation. And he said, did you mean train them with basic first aid? So I think he might be referring to law enforcement uh, or firefighters uh, or even security uh, at, say, a venue. Is that what you're referring to? Well, I think Stop the Bleeding is a campaign that we all have to get our arms around. We did real well with water safety, where we taught uh, we taught first aid, we taught um, ACLS, BLS, PALS, we taught AED. Now, I think we need to wholeheartedly get out there and teach Stop the Bleeding. And and if you're going to have security at a at a high rise, let's say, uh, so before EMS can get there, you you might teach them AEDs. I know I went this morning to my fitness center and there's an AED there. So everybody's AED co compliant. They, they understand how to use the AED. We could also make sure that everybody's at any venue where someone could bleed to teach them stop the bleeding. And, and that's part of the SALT triage, right? Life-saving intervention is to stop the bleeding. Look at if the Orlando, the Pulse nightclub shooting, bef the first responders couldn't go in, but there are a lot of people in there. And with buddy assistance, if there was some, if there was an opportunity where everybody in there kind of knew how to stop the bleeding, who knows? Uh, but if we could, if we could stop the bleeding, maybe more people would have, would have survived or done better. So the answer to your question, I think, is if anything, stop the bleeding. Uh, we could teach that everywhere. All right. Um, well, that looks like it is the last question. I'm just gonna double check here. Um, 
We did have Carlo Riolini just thanking you, Eric, for doing a great presentation. Um, Thank you. And uh, mentioning EMDM. And um, one last look here, see if there's any last questions. No, I think we got them all answered. Well, if that's the case, then I do want to thank um, Dr. Weinstein for presenting. Um, it's worth noting that these are all volunteer presentations, so um, Eric's taking time out of his day to do this and you know, put the uh, work together to get the presentation ready to go, and um, there's, there's no compensation, um, so we're really dependent on um, volunteers to help uh, get this information out and to share their thank, time. Thank you. everyone for attending. Thank you for attending. And, um, I'll just quickly mention again before we go, the next webinar will be at the same time, um, 11.30 a.m. start time, Eastern Standard Time, and we'll feature Sean Smith, um, and the title is Medical Detectives and Mass Fatality Incidents, so we'll be sending out some information about that and how to register. And lastly, just to mention it one last time for everyone, this is recorded. We'll post the recording and the slides uh, online tomorrow and let everyone know by email. So thanks, Eric. Really appreciate you doing this for us. And thank you, everyone, for participating and supporting our webinar series. Thank you. Thank you, for everybody, for attending.